Hey guys, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. So good being with you tonight as always, and um, it's going to be a great night. I have a really good friend on here tonight. It's going to be a tremendous blessing to you. So uh, I just want to see you log on with us tonight, and uh, if you're coming on with us, just say hey and uh, tell us where you're from, who you are, and uh, we'll just give a few minutes for folks to get on live with us tonight, okay? So I see you guys coming on, and uh, you know, since COVID began last morning, Wednesday night Bible studies just like this, just uh, online, and we've had some tremendous tremendous studies but it's good to see you guys it's good to see mary and sheila Rhodes with us and ike and lucille hey kezia you did a great job last week on the bible study with us and good seeing you on here and uh, good seeing tracy and miss phyllis great seeing you rebecca and uh hey deborah so i don't know just say hi to one another it's kind of like you're in church shaking hands right hey good to see you jackie and mike and lita and eric and lou going to be a great night it's going to be a great night we've been having tremendous services in our church and uh, the church is coming back strong after you know after the whole year of covid it's just been great over the past couple months and great seeing you out you guys out and uh seeing what the lord's doing people getting saved every single sunday and god is uh, doing mighty things i've heard of great healing testimonies and all kinds of great stuff hey lynn and richard hey denise hey barbara hey carola uh Good seeing all of you guys. I'll give it just another minute till we get uh, a more folk, a few, a few more folks gathered in, and we'll begin this process. All right, praise the Lord. We are kind of heavy-hearted tonight for Elizabeth City. We heard there was a police shooting, and uh, we hate that for all parties involved. And we've been praying as a staff today already, and uh, we'll continue to pray. And you guys just join with us. Our church has always stood for unity in this area. And we fought long and hard for that. And uh, we're going to continue doing that, continue being a church, uh, open doors and open hearts. All right. Hey, Kim. Hey, Brian. Hey, Amber. Good seeing you from D.C. Uh, hey, uh, Mark. Good seeing you guys. Mark and Pat. Wonderful. Diane, good seeing you. Good seeing you, Nikki. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and launch in. We're in between studies right now. I finished uh, going through the book of Job. I started the uh, Old Testament wisdom literature uh, recently, and it, at the, I guess at the beginning of the year, right? And we went through the book of Job, which was a long process, and I'm getting ready to jump into the book of Psalms, which to me is like climbing Mount Everest, but I'm going to do it. But in the time in between, I've taken, I've just interviewed a few guests and uh, we've had such great response from this. And last week with Kezia Davis on with us was really fantastic. So tonight I have Mike Shreve with us and, uh, I've known Mike for many years. He's been a wonderful, wonderful friend. Uh, I was introduced to Mike by my wife, Jackie. Um, I think we were just dating and she said, I have someone you're going to enjoy Hans because, uh, you're just going to enjoy him. So I started listening to Mike's old cassette tapes years ago, and she took me to a meeting one night, introduced me to Mike, and we just had a kindred spirit because he's a great teacher. He's uh, uh, amazing, amazing in the word, and his testimony is just amazing. And he's celebrating 50 years of ministry uh, right, right in this, I think he said March, uh, 50 years ago, he preached his first sermon. So so let's welcome Mike Shreve. Well, hey Mike, it's wonderful to be with you, and I certainly love you and love uh, what you're doing there in Elizabeth City, and looking forward to this meeting tonight online. Amen, amen. Maybe you guys can give us a wave. Some of our church folks can say hi to Mike and just give a wave. And and as it goes on, if you want to ask some questions, you can, and I'll be uh, I'll be watching our response on Facebook. Okay. So Mike is, is, a, is a fantastic author, he's a book publisher, he's an evangelist, he's a teacher, he's got so much, There's, we could go on for days with what's in Mike, and uh, you would be blessed. But anyhow, since we got into this subject last week with Kezia of coming out of Eastern religions and talking about 
Hinduism and all that. And we've been really talking about how to witness to people from other faiths. Uh, there's no one better at it in my mind than Mike Shree. So I wanted Mike to just greet you guys and maybe tell us a little bit of his testimony and uh, uh, where he comes from. Okay. All right, Mike. Well, it's such a joy again to be with you, Pastor Hans. And I'll just start at the very beginning, how God brought me into the kingdom of God. It was absolutely an act of a sovereign God reaching out to me. It happened in such a wonderful way. I was teaching yoga at four universities back in 1970 and 71. I was teaching at University of South Florida, University of Tampa, Florida Presbyterian College, and also a school down in Sarasota called New College. And I also was running a yoga ashram. Incidentally, for those who are not real familiar with it, the word yoga comes from two root words, or, or the word yoga rather means yoke. And, uh, and it implies being yoked with God, or at least the Hindu concept of God. And I learned under a guru, and the word guru is from two root words, gu and ru. That makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> and those two words mean out of darkness into light. So when you get initiated into yoga by a guru, it's supposed to bring you out of darkness into the light. And that's what I felt I was doing for people. I had hundreds of students who considered me their guru. And then the Tampa Tribune newspaper did a big article on me. I thought it would increase my class attendance dramatically. I did not know that it would alert a prayer group to start praying for me on a continuing basis. And this prayer group uh, cut the article out of the newspaper and pinned it to their prayer board and assigned somebody to be fasting and praying for me every hour of every day on a 24 hour prayer chain. Those people really, really believed in intercession. In fact, when they read the story in the newspaper about how I was being so influential on the college campuses, they said, not on our watch, we're either going to pray salvation into him or pray him out of town. And so thank God, God answered the first. Uh, and the way it all fitted together was just beyond coincidence. In fact, I don't call them coincidences. I call them God incidences. Uh, shortly after they began praying for me, I received a letter from an old friend of mine and he had left college to study under a different guru than I had. And he told me how he'd walked in a church and heard an audible voice say, Jesus is the only way. And he experienced being born again, which was a term I was unfamiliar with, having been raised Roman Catholic. And I wrote him back initially and kind of brushed it off and said, Larry, that's good for you. But I feel like Christianity is devotion to an individual deity, which is a lesser path. It's called bhakti yoga, uh, commitment or devotion to uh, a certain god or goddess. And I, I said, that's not for me. But his letter just kept weighing on my mind until finally I thought, you know, I'm a truth seeker. I should at least open my heart up to this thing called Christianity, even though I believe it's illogical and certainly limiting because it uh, declared to be the only way uh, when I thought my beliefs encompassed all religions of the world, very pluralistic in my approach. Uh, but I was open. And so I dedicated one day to Jesus. And I said over and over again, Jesus, if you really are the savior of the world, if you really died on the cross for the sins of humanity, if you really rose from the dead, and if you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by you, then give me a supernatural sign today. So I prayed all day long expecting a vision, an audible voice, some type of apparition, some type of visitation, but nothing supernatural happened. However, God heard me. Because later that afternoon, I was hitchhiking to go teach at University of South Florida. I had renounced all material possessions, so I had to walk or hitchhike everywhere. And while I was hitchhiking, I was still praying, Lord Jesus, if you're the only way, if you're the answer, if you're the key to salvation, show me, give me a sign. 
So two miles away, one of the members of the prayer group was walking into a laundromat. He was a college student, ironically, but it wasn't a mistake. He was a former yoga student himself who had found the Lord. And he studied under a guru that I greatly respected, Yogananda. And so he was walking in the laundromat and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, don't go in there, get back in your van and start driving. I've got a job for you to do. That's all the instructions God gave him. And if we're going to talk about effectively winning people to the Lord tonight, I think this is a major point that you've got to be open to that impulse that carries you a different direction than your pre-planned agenda. Uh, because he thought it was completely illogical that God did not want him to wash his dirty clothes. And he didn't know the yoga student or the yoga teacher rather that he had been praying for, for almost a month was two miles down the road. God knew that, but God didn't fill in that detail. And so he started driving and whenever he felt an impulse, he would turn and God led him to the very spot where I was hitchhiking and my thumb was stuck out there. He told me he went by a cardinal rule that he never picked up hitchhikers, but he said he was so compelled by the Holy Spirit. It was almost like invisible hands grabbed the wheel and forced him to turn. Mm. And when I opened the door to his van, his old Volkswagen hippie van, up on the ceiling of the van was a picture of Jesus that he had taped there. My heart leapt inside of me. I knew this is my sign. And so I was ready. I was ripe for the picking. And a few minutes later, he said, friend, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, definitely. He said, have you ever experienced Jesus coming into your heart? I said, no, but when can I? And he gave me this surprise look like, you're not supposed to give in that quick. And he said, you can come to our prayer meeting tonight. I said, I don't want to wait for a prayer meeting. If I can be born again, I want to find that experience right now. And so we knelt down in the back of his van and he parked across the street from Bush Beer Manufacturing Company. Great place to get saved, right? And I stumbled through a prayer because I, my logic screamed out against the idea of a crucified person's blood washing me clean from my sin. And I thought everyone was a potential Christ, that everyone had a Christ nature, and that Jesus was just a prototype, that he was no different than any of us, but he was awakened to God consciousness. And so we pulled him down to our level and pulled ourselves up to his level and, and tried to be equal to that. But when I received Jesus into my heart, I realized then and there, he truly was the only image of the invisible God and that he was God manifested on the flesh when he walked on the earth, and that we were mere human beings in need of salvation. I was so impacted by that experience of being born again that I asked the guy who won me to the Lord to go with me to my yoga class that night, which he did, and all the rest of that week. And I shared my testimony and told them that their guru had turned into what they termed, some of them called me a Jesus freak, and that I'd had an encounter with the Lord that totally changed my mindset, my worldview, my doctrinal base, and that I'd finally met God. And most of my main students became Christians as well. And so that was my beginning. And I've learned, Pastor Hans, that whatever you go through in life is qualification for ministry. God doesn't always call the qualified, but he always qualifies the called. And one of the main qualifications for a calling is to be delivered from a certain aspect of darkness. And if God brings you out of that particular type of problem or darkness in your life, you earn the right to reach back and deliver someone else from the same dilemma or the same mindset or the same religious deception in my case. And so God has blessed me to be able to reach Hindu people and new age people and yoga advocates. And we're seeing more fruit in that area than we ever have. And certainly that's something I'm praying for. Well, well Mike, you know, I've, uh, of course, I, uh, our, my church knows that Jackie and I had the great privilege of traveling with Mike for a season of time. And uh, I listened to him preach a lot and I heard him say, 
whatever you've been delivered from, you earn the right to deliver someone else from or something of that nature. And I've used that so much uh, through the years. But um, so, Mike, when you and your testimony is just phenomenal. I love it. I've told it before. But then you became a radical evangelist right from the get go. Could you tell us how you just got into evangelism? Well, I shared a little bit of that with you right before the, uh, the session tonight. Uh, I went to a Christian community in Central Florida to begin with, and I worked construction work uh, for about three to four months, uh, maybe a little longer. I was mixing mud and carrying blocks and working on a construction crew and earning good money and giving 90% of my paycheck to the work of the Lord and keeping 10%. We were all crazy radicals. We, we believed 10% was way too little for God. <laughs> and so uh, one night outside the commune, uh, we were sitting around a campfire, and finally it, uh, it whittled down to just me and one other guy sitting there at the fire, and he popped a question. He said, I've been reading Luke chapter 14, and I read this challenge Jesus gave. He said, except a man forsake all, he cannot be my disciple. He said, do you know anybody doing that? I said, no, I don't. He said, let's do it. I said, that sounds exciting. I'm game. And so, and so we gave away everything we own. We forsook all, literally. And he gave his car away. I gave my music equipment away. We gave all our money to the poor. We gave all our clothing, all our possessions away. We did keep one change of clothes, which turned out to be a real wise choice later on. You, it'd be very hard to wash your only set of clothes with nothing to switch into. And we kept a Bible and we started hitchhiking across the country, preaching on college campuses. And my first message was in Bloomington, Indiana. We hitchhiked about a thousand miles to a church in Bloomington that had invited us to come preach. But when we got to the city, the pastor told us that he had decided against holding the meeting. Well, we've given away thousands of dollars worth of personal possessions. We've hitchhiked, we've gone hungry for days. We've slept in the woods to go preach this revival and it gets canceled before our first night, which was very disconcerting and depressing and discouraging, but God was in it. I should have known the story of Jacob back then, that God is in this place, and I knew it not. I'm sure Jacob was very discouraged when he fled from his brother Esau, and yet God was positioning him for a purpose. And see, if we had held that meeting in that little tiny church, it was a lot of real harsh, uh, fundamentalist-type believers, and the kind of group that God wanted us to reach would never have gone to a church like that. So anyway, we're discouraged. We're walking down through the city. Bob says, Mike, we came to Indiana to preach, so we're going to preach. I said, how can we preach, man? We don't have any place to go to. No one's invited us. He said, let's walk and pray. So we walked down through the city, and we happened to see a big field that had been purchased by the Yippies, and they were communists uh, that had an origin in the hippie movement, and they had become politically oriented, and they were known as yippies. That might be a foreign word to a lot of people right now, but they were pretty strong. In fact, a lot of people in government now started out in the yippie movement, and they were very liberal-minded, extremely, and very communistic in their mindset, socialistic. And there was this great big sign in the middle of the field that proclaimed it was the people's property, the people's park. In fact, it's there to this day in Bloomington, Indiana. You can look it up online. And it was a statement for socialism that uh, they had purchased the property for the free use of anybody that wanted to use it. And so Bob turned around to me and said, that's our church. That's where we're going to hold a meeting. And so we claimed the property. We did it right. We marched around it seven times speaking in tongues. We uh, uh, declared your kingdom come, your will be done, Lord. Then we went over to the pizza hut across the street and got some old pizza boxes out of their dumpster and wrote with a big red magic marker, revival, old fashioned street preaching, miracle signs and wonders, healing the sick, casting out devils, 
uh, raising the dead, prophesying every night at 730. And we put those signs up at all four corners. And then in order to keep the people from having to sit on wet grass, we went back to the pizza dumpster and found a bunch of beer boxes, Paps Blue Ribbon Beer. And we flattened those cardboard boxes out so people could have something to sit on. And I tell people the communists supplied my first church and a beer company supplied my first pews. And that, <laughs> night, <laughs> that night I preached on except a man lose his life for my sake and for the gospels. Jesus said he will not find it. I had about a hundred people, most of them druggies and hippies and uh, about three fourths of them from a hippie commune locally and all into witchcraft and occultism. And one guy that was there that night played with a band that was the lead band for Led Zeppelin. And I gave an invitation and upwards around, I don't know, I really don't know. I didn't bother taking account, but probably 80 or 90% of them gave their hearts to the Lord. And wow, it, it was wow. the launch of my ministry. And that was around March of 1971. Praise wow. God, Bloomington, Indiana. 50 years ago, my Jubilee year. Hey, congratulations, Mike. I, I, some of your evangelistic stories are my favorites. I'm telling you, and some of the crazy things that uh, uh, the Lord has accomplished through you. So um, you, we, we had this question come up last week uh, when we were doing Wednesday Night Bible Study. And I just want, you've already addressed it a little bit, but so should a Christian practice yoga? Well, I think you know my answer to that. I say absolutely not. And sometimes people get a little troubled by that response, but I know the basis of yoga. Uh, I know that I became demon possessed and I know what the whole goal of yoga is. Even a great Hindu leader, a respected Hindu leader said, there is no yoga without Hinduism and no Hinduism without yoga. They're inseparable and yoga is inextricable from Hinduism. I have a little booklet. I'm not going to be able to go over all the points, but I've got a little booklet called Seven Reasons I No Longer Practice Yoga. It really sums it up good. And one of the reasons is the very word yoga, as I mentioned, comes from a Sanskrit word that means yoke, and the implication is union with God. And yet the basis of it the idea behind it is a totally different view of the Godhead than a biblical view. And that is union with Brahman. In Hinduism, Brahman is ultimate reality. And Brahman is not a personal God. Brahman is an impersonal life force. In fact, Brahman is the life within every tree, every flower, every animal, every human being, that divine essence, they say that, uh, uh, that imparts life to all living things is Brahman. And that in order to find God, you look within because that life force, that cosmic energy force or level of consciousness is already within you. And so the whole purpose of yoga is to awaken this divine essence and they call it, and this is the scary part. They call it the Kundalini. And the Kundalini is a word that means serpent power. And it's a description of what they say is a coiled energy laying dormant at the base of the spine. In most human beings, it's dormant because they live uh, a life that is ruled by flesh consciousness, by the cravings and desires of the flesh. But those who are spiritual uh, tap into this inner essence of divinity this kundalini power and the whole purpose of even the physical exercises is to awaken the serpent power so that it travels up through seven energy centers that are called chakras and they're they don't exist they're imaginary in fact the guru i studied under even though he was a hindu slash sikh he said they were just imaginary and an aid to meditation uh, but supposedly according to that worldview this serpent power travels up through the spine until it merges with what's called the crown chakra and the third eye. That's the one most people are familiar with. Uh, and that's when you go out of your body into God consciousness or you merge with the Godhead. Well, it's all demon possession. It's a false experience 
of a false god. It's a false experience of oneness with God because it's a, a, a supernatural power. Yes, you feel a power surging through you. But uh, I get phone calls from people all around the world of, uh, of people that are desperate for deliverance because they've gotten involved in yoga classes and they started having these spontaneous kundalini awakenings that got uncontrollable. They couldn't even sleep at night. These surges of energy would be going through them. And uh, they were scared, very scared, because they knew. In fact, the gurus used to warn us that if we didn't discipline our lives effectively before that awakening took place, that it could result in insanity. It could result in psychic powers, dark occult powers being awakened in us. It could result in demonic visitations. Mm -hmm. And so they were always urging us to live more and more uh, in a self-denying way in order to withdraw from the world and, and, and be clean enough in our thinking, in our lifestyle to be prepared for this awakening. And so wow. what, I tell, what I tell people is there's no account in the Bible of anyone ever having an encounter with the true and the living God that went insane as a result. Yeah. And so the very fact that it can cause insanity is an indication to me that the serpent power really is of the serpent. Being raised Catholic, I should have known enough about the biblical history of creation to know that a serpent represented evil. It represents yeah. Satan, who's called that great serpent, uh, the dragon of Revelation 12, that old serpent that uh, deceives the whole human race. And so yoga is, I believe personally, and this may sound really out there to some people, but I believe yoga is preparing the world to receive a one world religion. And it's like the front door to something very insidious that's happening behind the scenes. And to explain that, let me share this little story. Many years ago, I won a, uh, a pimp to the Lord in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a great story that goes along with that, but it would take the whole program. And he ran a restaurant in town where all the girls worked as waitresses, and then they walked the streets at night, and they laundered the money through the restaurant. So the restaurant was a front for something that was a much more evil agenda behind the scenes. And all these yoga studios, tens of thousands of yoga studios, are really... Uh, they're, they're the enemy's front door to, to bring people into a worldview that causes their biblical worldview to erode because mm -hmm. they get around people that say all religions are relevant paths to God. God is already inside of you. To find God, you look within, and, and they get off track. Uh, I, I've met so many that have had their Christianity contaminated because they started accepting some of these things and they said we need to redeem some of these ideas that have been lost so god's going to redeem yoga and make it useful and we can be a christian and practice yoga at the same time not knowing that one of the main deities in hinduism is shiva and there you've got brahma and vishnu and shiva brahma is the creator god vishnu is the preserver god and Shiva is the destroyer God, and he's also referred to as the Lord of Yoga. Wow. And, and so uh, it, it's, again, it's inseparable, inseparable from its Hindu roots. So, Mike, uh, you know, I know meditation becomes part of the, the, the worldview, too. And meditation is biblical, really, but it's a it's different than eastern meditation correct absolutely in fact i did a podcast on that recently uh meditation uh right or wrong and i went into buddhist meditation hindu meditation uh also uh meditation that is uh part of a contemplative prayer movement and i believe there's some aspects of that that are good and and some that really just dress up buddhist techniques in in Christian terminology. And so uh, I compared all of these and one marked difference between Far Eastern meditation and true biblical or Christian meditation 
is the difference in goals. In Eastern meditation, you do it in order to achieve some kind of oneness with God, and you do so by emptying your mind. Buddhists call it emptying your mind of, uh, or uh, people into martial arts call it emptying your mind of the monkey chatter. Yeah, emptying your mind of all the thoughts uh, that normally just rush through our minds unpredictably. And then if you can still your mind, you can, quote unquote, enter the silence where you can have mystical experiences. And sometimes they try to achieve that with yantras, which are geometric designs that represent different deities, or they try and uh, accomplish that through the use of mantras. And I did that for the most part. Uh, and I, I've met Christians through the year, bless their heart, that have said, when I go to a yoga class, they start chanting Om. I just don't participate. And in my heart, I just call on Jesus. Well, I would not want to be in the room that word is being chanted unless I was there to share the gospel with all of them. And uh, otherwise, I, I wouldn't want to be around because the word Om really when it's chanted, it's divided up into three sounds, A, U, and M. And it's stretched out in a very monotone way. And those three sounds that become like three syllables, making up a one-syllable word, uh, represent the three chief gods that I just mentioned. Brahma, the creator god, Vishnu, the preserver god, and Shiva, the destroyer wow. god. And it is an invocation to those gods to come and manifest in you and take you over and and bring you into oneness with them. And so it's a, a very, very dangerous thing. And and I often take people to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus said, use not vain repetitions like the heathen do, for they believe that they'll be heard for their much speaking. Well, why uh, do people feel a semblance of peace when they do this? Well, if you were to sit in a chair and close your eyes and chant the word banana for 30 minutes, I guarantee you, you would feel a semblance of peace. It would calm your mind from all the stuff going on, the pressures of life. And so, yes, there's a certain soulish kind of emotion-based peace that you might feel, but it's not the peace of God. It's a counterfeit peace. And besides, I... I explain it to people this way, that we started this conversation about 30 minutes ago. If I had taken a five-word statement and repeated it in a monotone way over and over again, by the time I said it nine or ten times, you would have said, folks, we're um, canceling this online session. I'm just going to teach on another subject. We've, we've cut off from our speaker. I think he's lost his mind because you're an intelligent human being. And you need a flow of ideas right. that flow into your mind, and then you respond with your point of view. And to think God would respond to something like that, to me, is an insult to his intelligence, because he's of a genius level that is unimaginable. And I don't think he, uh, I don't, well, I'll, I'll phrase it differently. He is not going to respond to a repetitious phrase over and over again. Uh, it, it's just, uh, it, it would be about as ridiculous as walking up to your wife or your husband and chanting, I love you over and over again for over an hour, thinking that's going to gain you a deeper relationship with your wife or husband. No, they'll call for the guys with the white coats. And <laughs> say, I, I need you to come get my husband, my wife. She's going crazy. He's going crazy. So uh, if people would not respond to that approach conversationally, God's not going to respond because meditation from a Christian perspective is not emptying your mind. It's filling your mind in a very uh, sometimes slow way and, and a way of pondering the word. You read a psalm like you're about to go into in your studies and you slowly dwell on each verse and ask for the Holy Spirit to help you see the interpretation or fresh levels of revelation in that verse. But it's not an object of achieving a relationship with God. It's a celebration 
of a relationship you already have. So you're not trying to earn through the chanting of a mantra, a connection with God. You're enjoying a connection that was given to you the day you got born again. So it's wow. much, much different. And there's a lot more to it. In fact, I would urge people to, uh, to go to my, uh, uh, the company that I work with is cpnshows.com, which is Charisma Podcast Network, cpnshows.com, and look up Revealing the True Light. And that's my podcast on Fridays. And or rather on Tuesdays, I'm sorry, that's my podcast on Tuesdays. And one of my most recent ones was on meditation. And I go into a lot more detail. Yeah, excellent. I, I have uh, listened to several of the episodes of uh, Mike's podcast, Revealing the True Light. He has one on the Kundalini spirit that was really fascinating and uh, just great stuff. So, so, Mike, now you've led so many people to the Lord over your 50 years of ministry and you've had success in an area that I think is very difficult. And that would, that's leading people from other religions to the Lord. And, um, what insight could you give us on how to witness? I mean, I think it could help us just witnessing to the average Joe down at Walmart, but uh, what insight could you give us on witnessing to people, especially people of different faiths? Well, I usually choose one of two methods, either the Pauline method that was, uh, that was evidenced at Mars Hill or the Jesus method there with the woman at the well. Because at Mars Hill, Paul could have really entered into a heavy-handed argument with them over idolatry, but instead he captured their curiosity by saying yeah. that statue to the unknown God, that's the one I serve. And instead yeah. of feeling like he was bashing their belief system, they opened their hearts to what he had to say. And so he approached their intellectual curiosity. And Hindu people tend to be very intellectual. And so I use that kind of method with them quite often. And I have a certain analogy I use almost every time I preach in India. But then Jesus approached it differently with the Samaritan woman. He could have nailed her for all the false doctrines Samaritans held to uh, that were part of the reason that Jews had such animosity toward the Samaritans. But instead, he bypassed all of that, and he saw the spiritual thirst inside of her. And, and that's what he appealed to. He didn't try and get her doctrine straight. He just introduced her to an encounter. And he said, if you drink of the water that I shall give you, it will be in you a well of water springing up into everlasting life. She said, Lord, give me this water that I thirst not. And so that's the kind of method we also should use in trying to reach people. The man who won me to the Lord did not try to get my doctrine straight all at once before I got saved. In fact, I informed him. I said, listen, there's some things about Christianity I can't receive. I said, I can't believe the Bible is God's inspired word. I said it was written uh, by about 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. I can't believe that was God's inspired word. He said, don't worry about that. Just try Jesus. And then I said, man, I can't, I can't bring myself to believe in a literal hell. He said, don't worry about that. Just try Jesus. And he smile, this big smile every time he said it. Then finally, I, I, I shifted to the other side. Instead of telling him what I couldn't believe about Christianity, I told him what I couldn't give up as a belief. I said, I'll never quit believing in reincarnation. And instead of launching into this doctrinal squabble about why there's only one life, he just smiled at me again and said, don't worry about that. Just try Jesus. And so he was very persuasive. And once I found the Lord, then I had the inward presence of the spirit of truth inside of me that testified of the validity of the scripture being inspired, that testified of the fact that there's only one life and also that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And so my belief system was adjusted by an encounter. And I think far too often Christians try and talk people into believing something a certain way, 
when really what they need is an encounter with Jesus. And once they encounter the Lord, a lot of those things will fall into place. I told you I have one particular thing, one particular analogy I like to share with Hindu people. And that's this, uh, that many Hindus, not all Hindus, but many Hindus believe in what's called Advaita Vedanta, A-D-V-A-I-T-A, Advaita Vedanta. And basically what it means is uh, pantheism is the basis of that belief system. And the Vedas are their sacred scripture. And so they believe in a pantheistic interpretation of the Vedas, which means pantheism means all is God. Pan means all, theism means God. So everything in the world is a literal manifestation of the Godhead. So everything has absolutely a divine essence. Like I mentioned earlier, the tree is God, the cat is God, the dog is God, every human being is God in manifestation, expression. They do not believe in a creation. They believe that the universe was emanated, not created, but emanated out of Brahman, out of the Godhead, and that one day it will all return back to Godhead. And because they believe that, it's no quantum leap of logic to say, we are God. Because if my pet dog in the backyard can be God, I can be God. But if you say, we are God, that little word, we, is like an acrostic that represents two words, the worst of the human race and the most excellent of the human race. So if you say, we are God, that means Hitler was God manifested a ruthless, demonically infested, murderous, bloodthirsty, uh, and and I could go on and on with negative adjectives describing such an evil person. How could that be a manifestation of God? And then shifting over to the other side, a beautiful soul like Mother Teresa, devoting herself to the poor of Calcutta and, and giving her life for the most overlooked of society. She's a manifestation of God, but so is Hitler. So if if you believe that we are God, and that includes the worst and the most excellent, then you have to leap to the next conclusion that God is both evil and good. God is both darkness and light. And that's unacceptable, even to logic oriented people. That's unacceptable. You don't have to be a Christian to ponder the enormity of that kind of idea, what it really transposes into. In fact, that's the meaning of this symbol on a book that I've written in search of the true light. This symbol right here, the yin-yang symbol, is the symbol of ancient Taoism. And the dark teardrop and the white teardrop being in the same circle represents the idea that ultimate reality is both darkness and light, both evil and good, because everything is a manifestation of that cosmic energy force. Uh, That's unacceptable. The only way that God's nature can be untainted and that God's character, his integrity is preserved is for theism to be correct, not pantheism, but God being separate from the physical universe. And if God is separate from the physical universe, the evil that is here was not created by him. The evil that is here has three sources. It's from a fallen angel, Satan, who is the spirit that works in all the children of disobedience. And and of course the demonic forces that work underneath him. And then a fallen man, Adam, and then a fallen world system that is corrupt because of Satan's influence and because of Adam's transgression and his fallen state and lower nature passed on to us. And so uh, then God is not the one to blame as the source of evil. And when I speak that, when I share that with a Hindu person, well, I want Hindus by sharing that particular point of view with them. Wow. Wow, that is so powerful, Mike. So, and and what I'm hearing is this great spirit of love you have, and and honoring the dignity of the human person. That uh, I think when we witness to people, we need to realize no matter how lost they are, how far gone they are in sin, 
each person is created in the image of God and there's a dignity and a value to them. So you're not coming, arguing, trying to make your point, you know, you're coming with love and addressing the need in their life, but not afraid to use logic and uh, true reason to bring them to, to a response. Beautiful. So I, I don't know if, you know, we have some time left, Mike, and there's a story. I don't know if you have time to tell it, but used to tell this story, you're talking about being led of the spirit to witness to people and hearing the voice of the spirit. I remember you telling a story of uh, you had been ministering in India and you came and you were going to a restaurant to eat because it had been days since you had had a decent meal and you heard the voice of the Lord say, go out on the street. You remember what right. I'm talking about? Right. I, I've told that story many, many times and I still marvel over it. Uh, I was in Bombay, India, and I had a layover of about 12 hours unexpectedly between flights. There was some kind of problem with the airplane. And at first, I was very disturbed by it because I did not want to sit in the airport at Bombay for 12 hours. It's not like the airports here in the United States of America at all. And it may have been upgraded since then, but this was quite a few years ago. And so... I was disturbed about it, but then I got a little sheet of paper from the airline I was flying with that stated if you had over an eight hour layover, they would put you up in a five star hotel. Well, I had never stayed in a five star hotel. I usually live with the pastors over in India that I preached with. And so I was thinking, oh, wow, this is my reward <laughs> for a month of sacrifice over here. Yes, Lord, I'm ready. And so I got on the trolley that went over to the uh, the big hotel, and I was signing uh, the the necessary forms to get checked in. And I happened to look over and saw this really, really nice restaurant, luxurious five-star restaurant that was part of the hotel. And I thought, oh, wow, I've been eating rice and beans and chicken for a month. I'm going to be able to have this fantastic fantastic meal. And so I checked in and started toward the restaurant. And the thing I most greatly feared came upon me, to quote from the book of Job. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the voice of the Lord say, don't go in there. I've got a job for you to do. Go wow. out on the street. And at first I said what most people say. I said, is that you, Lord? And I really wanted him to say, no, I was just kidding. Go on in and join your meal. Uh, but he kept weighing on my heart, go out on the street. So it was a, a moment of destiny there where I said yes to God very begrudgingly, uh, turned around, went out on the street. And I thought, now, if I'm going to do this, I've got to do it with all my heart. So I went down the street and uh, I was claiming your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and claiming dominion and binding the strongholds of demonic control that have been there for centuries and millennia. And while I'm going down the road, interceding, all of a sudden from a restaurant next door to the big motel, a different restaurant, uh, this man came running out of the restaurant, a little short man, about four foot 10. He runs up to me with this high pitched voice. He says, what is your name? I said, my name is Mike Shreve. He said, Mike Shreve, that sounds like a Christian name. By any chance, are you a Christian? I said, by the way, I am a Christian. He said, by any chance, are you a Pentecostal preacher? I said, I am a Pentecostal preacher. He said, good, there's a man needs to get saved right now. Come quickly, come quickly. And I thought, I can't even believe this is happening. I've never had a a waiter run out of a Burger King and tell me, come in here quickly. Somebody needs to get saved here in the U.S. But this man was a believer, and he had been witnessing to his boss for three years, who was a Roman Catholic, about being born again. And his boss had rejected him over and over again. And that night, you know, God is a God who weaves these things together in amazing yes. ways. That night, he told his chief, uh, his chief waiter, the man who ran out and, and, and confronted me, he told him, I don't know why, but on my way to work, I decided what you've got is real and I want it. And so he runs out of his restaurant, hoping that there'll be somebody out there to help him pray. And I just happened 
to be walking by halfway around the world from home wow. Wow. <laughs> at the right place at the right time. And, and praise God, I went with his boss behind the restaurant and we sat down at a concrete table and it was the most difficult witnessing time I've ever endured. Not because of the man, but because I kept feeling things nibbling at my shoes. And I would look under the table and these big alley rats were crawling around under the table and biting my shoes. My wife told me if that had been her, she'd have let God deal with the man. She would have been out of the table. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, after about an hour of talking with him, I, I said, I, he said, I'm ready. I'm ready. I want to pray. So we prayed together. He really poured out his heart to God, got genuinely born again. And then he said, all of a sudden, kind of uh, real quickly, he said, let's go back to my restaurant. And so he jumped up, I rose up with him, and we walked back to his restaurant. And then whispering, he said, when I get back to my restaurant, he said, I'm going to lock the door. And I'm going to close all the shutters and I'm going to turn the lights down real low. I had no idea what he had in mind. I, I was a little suspicious. I said, what happens then? He said, then in broken English, he said, then I'm going to call all my waiters and dishwashers and waitresses out. And I want you to tell them what you just told me. I said, well, what kind of religions are represented in your kitchen? He said, I have a Buddhist, I have a Jainist, I have three Hindus, I have two Catholics. He named four or five different religions. And he called them all out and he said, okay. I said, do they all understand English? He said, no. I said, can you interpret for me? He said, yes. And so he's saved for about 10 minutes and he interprets his first sermon. I preached for an hour everyone, every cook, waiter, and dishwasher, and waitress in that restaurant gave their hearts to the Lord. It was wow. absolutely awesome. And by the time we finished praying two or three hours later, most of them had been filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues also. It was an wow. incredible night. Uh, and uh, I never did miss my steak and lobster at the five-star restaurant. <laughs> uh, I, I got something that was a whole lot more valuable. Amen. So, so the so the power of listening to the voice of the Spirit, and 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 choosing the right words. Like that night, yeah. I told the Hindu people, the Hindu many Hindus believe in what's called avatars. Now, avatars mean something different now. Yeah. Uh, it means somebody to represent you, a little image on the screen or whatever. And of course, the movie avatars, but. Uh, in Hindu theology, an avatar is a manifestation of God on the earth. And so when I talk about Jesus, I will actually use that word with a Hindu. I wow. will say Jesus was the only avatar. And so the very fact that I would use one of their words kind of helps me connect with them. And, and of course, I go through the necessity of having your sins washed away. And that's huge for a Hindu person because they believe in karma and reincarnation. You have to somehow pay for your sins and have to go through a lot of self-denial in order to burn up your negative karma. And the whole idea that you can be cleansed of your sin in a moment's time and forgiven because of the death of Jesus on Calvary is just a, a phenomenal thought to them. And so that's something that always needs to be emphasized. Um, yeah, yeah. And, I've noticed people in America use the term karma. We, we use it kind of like you're going to get what you deserve, but karma is a deep uh, Eastern concept. It really is. And I've taught on that and, and really deal with it in, in my book, In Search of the True Light. I have one section that talks about 13 reasons I no longer believe in karma and reincarnation. I do believe in the law of sowing and reaping. Yes. But I believe that's uh, in a general sense, not a tit for tat, because right. uh, in karma, if you hit somebody, you've got to be hit. If you right. rob somebody, you've got to be robbed. And so it is an exact reproduction of the same evil thing in yeah, your yeah. life that you have to pay off until you're freed from the cycle of rebirths 
and you attain moksha, which is deliverance into a higher spiritual realm. But uh, And so it's a self-achieved salvation over thousands of lifetimes. In fact, uh, many sects in Hinduism teach that you are reincarnated over a million times from mineral to vegetable to animal to human state before you can get out of the cycle of rebirth. Uh, so, wow. Yeah, wow. wow is right. One of our church members is saying, thank God we don't get what we deserve. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the law of sowing and reaping is more general. Like if you're a hateful person, people are going to respond to you in a hateful way. Yes, that's absolutely true. And it's somewhat akin to the idea of karma. And that's why people, uh, when they see somebody that maybe has been very dishonest and they get robbed blind, uh, then they say, well, he, he, he got a karmic payoff. Well, in a way, yes, he, he reaped what he sowed, but yeah. it, it's not an affirmation of the doctrine of karma. Because right. karma goes a lot deeper. Yeah, Mike, this is this is fascinating. Our people are they're just uh, loving this. They're saying thank you for sharing these stories and uh, just giving God praise on here. But in the few minutes we have left, I wanted you to maybe tell us how we could get your resources and uh, because you've written some fantastic books and your whole project on the names and titles of the children of God. Is, has been going on for years. It's just fantastic. So maybe tell the folks how we could get your resources, and then I'm going to let you close us in prayer. All right. Well, I have an, a comparative religion website called thetruelight.net, and on the truelight.net, you can download this booklet for free. It's called The Highest Adventure Encountering God. Now, this one is in English, but it's also available in Japanese. We've had over a thousand Japanese people download the Japanese version wow. of this book. It's in German, it's in Portuguese, and it is in Spanish. And so we're reaching out. In fact, very soon it will be offered in Hindi and uh, Hebrew and a couple of other languages. Chinese, it will be offered in Chinese very soon. And it's free. And I would urge you to go to The True Light. That's Light. Dot net. Make sure you uh, type uh, N-E-T, not C-O-M, thetruelight.net. And uh, there's a lot of articles there, a lot of testimonies of people that have come out of various religions. And they could order this full-length book, which is In Search of the True Light. It's a comparison of over 20 religions. And one section of the book goes into 30 questions that most New Agers would ask and or people that are truth seekers might ask that I respond to. I respond to various Far Eastern beliefs or New Age beliefs in that section. And this is a great book, not only to learn comparative religions from, but to give to someone who's very pluralistic in their mindset that believes all religions are different paths to God. And as I mentioned, a lot of people that have questions about yoga, I never got into all seven arguments of why I no longer practice yoga. But this book says it all. And it's a little mini book. It's very inexpensive. And you can order that on the truelight.net or you can order it on shreveministries.org. And Pastor Hans, I would like to very quickly tell people some of the bait that I have uh, to stick on my hook when I'm out fishing for souls. I carry these with me everywhere I go. Now, you can't get these from me. You, I get these from the American Bible Society. This is the, the New Testament in Hindi and the New Testament in Gujarati. And I, oh, have, wow. I have found that most of the Indian people that take care of convenience stores and motels in this country are from Gujarat state. So I always carry the New Testament in Gujarat with me because my, my children learn that if I met a Hindu behind the counter in a convenience store, they could just lay the seat back. We'd be there for an hour. <laughs> And, and then I always carry the Jesus film. I'm sure you're familiar with the Jesus Project. This is the Jesus film on DVD in all the languages of India. And this is uh, oh, upside down. This is the Jesus film in uh, Arabic and some other languages that many Muslims speak. Because uh, I'm always trying to bring Muslim, I'm trying to leap over that impassable gulf culturally yeah. and religiously. And with enough love and enough concern, 
I, I've found one way to really reach people is ask them what they believe. Don't launch the conversation, tell them what you believe. Say, what is it you believe about God? Tell me. And then weave your way into a very congenial conversation. Because uh, the old saying is so true. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. And that's really, really true. And so, again, the websites are thetruelight.net and shreveministries.org. Now, if you go to shreveministries.org, then you can also get the information on my podcast. And then my YouTube channel is a lot of information. Sorry, my YouTube channel is Mike Shreve Ministries, uh, youtube.com slash Mike Shreve Ministries. And we have TV programs there on two veins of revelation. Number one, you mentioned the revelation of the names of the children of God. I've written a book on that, and we're doing TV shows on that every week that air on Sid Ross' is Supernatural Network. And we post it on our YouTube channel. And then I'm also doing TV programs on comparative religion subjects. And that's posted on our YouTube channel. So uh, any way we can be a blessing to people or help them with their loved ones or friends that are into yoga or Eastern religions, I'm very accessible. You shoot me an email off the website. I respond to them personally. As long as I uh, can do so, I want to be personally involved in wow. everything in the context. Well, well, Mike, thank you. You, you got listen to this guy. Look at this guy's at our church. We've just been so blessed. We've heard from one of the greatest, um, one of the greatest in the world, in my opinion, in this area of ministry. I'm telling you, it's just been a blessing, Mike. So um, it's eight o'clock. It looks like. So how about just closing us in prayer, Mike? And once again, thank you for being on with us. Well, it's my blessing. It was a joy to be with you, and of course, it was a joy just to spend time with you, Hans. Amen. Um, Father God, I thank you so much for people who have a heart to win souls. You yourself gave a prayer request. One of the very few things God himself asked us to pray for. You said, pray to the Lord of harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. I pray that you will remove fear from every Christian listening, fear of confrontation, fear of rejection. someone of another culture, another religion, another worldview, another mindset. Help love cast out all fear from us. And may we become so consumed with your love, Lord, that we will override our own sense of inadequacy or our own fear of rejection. And we will reach out to the world around us and find ways to win those that are overlooked in every community that no Christians witness to. Lord, there's so many that could be described that way. Help us, empower us to be those laborers. And Lord, also, uh, I ask if there's anyone who doesn't know you that's been listening to this uh, discussion tonight, that you will visit them, that you will come into their hearts, that they will call on the name of Jesus, and that you will wash them clean from their sins. In your wonderful name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Mike, so much. Hey, God bless everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Hans. God bless you all.